He said, my owner. And the Bible says, even though hundreds and thousands of people were following Jesus, none of them encountered the power of healing, except the one that recognized him as the king, as the owner. Uh, he said, somebody just referred to me as his owner. Somebody just entered into the kingdom. Somebody just realized that he belongs to a kingdom that has a king. And so the Bible says, who called me? Lord, bring him to me. That is why a bunch of us will come to church and go back the same because we think we come into church. I thank God that he made us call ourselves Love Legacy Chapel and not Love Legacy Church. Because this building is not a church, it's a chapel. You are the church. Huh. You are the church. I'm the church. We are the church. This building is just a chapel. We don't go to church. We are the church. No, you can't go to church. You are the church. The ecclesia. The legislative body of the kingdom of God. That is who you are. That is why when Jesus came and he began to have an interaction with Peter, he didn't say, the church. He says, I will build my church. Because Jesus was not the first to institute a church. There were churches before he came. A lot of us think that a church is a religious organization. No, a church simply means the cabinet. It means the senate. It means a group of people that are called to establish laws. So when Jesus came, he had to differentiate his church from all the other churches that were around. Because there were a lot of legislative bodies around. And so he had to say, I will build my church. Because there were other churches. Because if you went back to the original Greek word that we translate in the King James Version as church, is the word ecclesia. And the word ecclesia is not what we have in our mind. Ecclesia is a group of people that are called to sit down with a king, get what is on the mind of the king, turn them into laws so that the citizens will observe what the king is thinking about. So it was the work of the Senate, the cabinet, this group of people, the ecclesia, what we call church, who were supposed to daily sit in the presence of the king. King, what are you thinking about today? King, what is going through your mind today? King, what is the agenda for the coming season? It was their job to always be in the presence of the king, to get into the mind of the king so that they can legislate. So you cannot call yourself as the church and be disconnected from God. Mm, you got to be in his presence. To know what he's thinking about. To know what he's planning. To know what is going on in his mind. You got to get into the mind of God. That is what makes you a church. It's not a dress you wear on Sunday that makes you look churchy. I'm going to church. No, you can't go to church. You are the church. Somebody tell me, I am the church. Now, if you're listening to me on social media, I wanted to type it. I say, I am the church. I want to see you type it in the chat room right now on Zoom, on Facebook. I am the church because that is who you truly are. You are the church of the living God. Last week, we learned some interesting things. I want to recap up a few and then, you know, we transition. You know, when we talk about the church, it's so messed up that our mind, our mindset in terms of the church is totally and way different from what Jesus originally meant. It's just like the word baptism. Sometimes I don't feel like using the word baptism because the King James translation messed it up. The real word is immersion, to be buried under water. It's just like the word hell. There are three different words in the original translation that King James kept translating as hell. For instance, the word hell translated in some portions of the Bible is the word Hades. Hades. 
And if you listen to what Jesus says, he says, and the gate of hell. The word translated gate of hell there is the word Hades. He says, and the gate of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, I will build my church. I will call this group of people together to legislate. And the gate of Hades shall not prevail against it. In fact, if you look at the word Hades, Hades originally was a valley between Jerusalem and Bethany. It was a valley. So Jesus was just talking about that valley that God translated as hell. He, it's called Hades. And what is Hades? Hades was just a dumpster where the people in Israel dumped garbage. And because they dumped garbage there, that place consistently was set on fire. There was always something burning in that valley. And so they in their days could understand what Jesus was saying that I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. What was he talking about? He was just trying to tell them that you know what? If you don't accept this new kingdom, you are going to end up in Hades and the only thing physically they could use to uh, bring that expression clear to them was the fact that you're going to end up in a place which is a junkyard, a dumpster, a garbage place where it consistently burns without stopping. And then, of course, Jesus goes on in that interaction, maybe we should read it this morning. I love that interaction he has with um, John. Of course, the conversation was not just, um, excuse me, not John, with Peter alone, but with all the disciples. He was asking them about who they thought he was. And everybody had his own kind of understanding. And then Jesus moves this whole conversation to a, a whole new level. And then he asks them, but who do you say I am? And then nobody could understand who Jesus truly was except Peter. And then Peter opens his mouth and says, you know what, I know you are the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. And then he goes on to say, upon this I will build my church. And of course we get it wrong, a lot of people think that he's saying upon Peter. No, he says upon this revelation. I will build my church. It means the church I'm building is totally different from all the other ecclesia you have known up until now. And he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's talking about you, that the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Is somebody understanding that? He says the gates of hell will not prevail against you because you are the church. Say, I am the church. Am the church. And because of, that, because of that, the gates of hell, gates of hell cannot prevail against me. Oh, come on, somebody believes that? Amen. Well, I believe that. I don't know about you, but I believe that. He says, I am building this new group of people. And think about it. When you talk about the Ecclesia, I compared it like I've been doing over the last few weeks, you know, because we live in a democratic environment, sometimes it becomes almost impossible for us to really understand how the kingdom is supposed to operate because we don't know any better. We only know about democracy. But I realize that in democracy, power is from bottom up. It means you can't get to the White House without the masses voting for you. It means that real power is in the hands of those at the bottom. So power is from the bottom up. But in the kingdom, it's the direct opposite. The power is from the top to the bottom. Check it out in the book of Psalm 133. Bible says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in what? Unity. It is like oil upon the head. Oil is the anointing. It is the power of God. It flows from the head down. And we understand that the word of the king is law. And so the king is the only law. The law in the democratic environment is from the people. 
But I think about it this way too. Just as the power is from bottom up. I mean, of course, if the people don't like you, they can, they can have a referendum and remove you from the office in a democratic environment. But you can't do that. How many of us can remove God as a king? You dare not. <laughs> but that is what a kingdom looks like. You can't. So the power in the kingdom is from the top going down. But in democracy, we see the direct opposite, where the power is in the hands of the people. And because we live in that kind of environment, it becomes very difficult and challenging for us to understand how things operate in the kingdom of God. Sometimes we want to have a meeting and reanalyze what God has said from the pulpit. No, it's not democracy. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is not what? It's not democracy. Now, do you realize that in democracy, you and I, the people, are the ones that choose the leadership? No, we choose them. Who put Biden in the office? The people. He didn't put himself there. But in the kingdom, it's the opposite. The king chooses the followers. In democracy, the people choose the leader. In the kingdom, the king chooses the followers. In fact, Jesus said it plainly. You did not choose me. I chose you. <laughs> oh, I love the word. He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. He said, in my kingdom, you can't even choose who must be your pastor. I will give you pastors after my own heart. So you don't leave a, a church because you don't like the pastor. If you did that, it's simply because you don't understand the kingdom. You are not in a democratic church. Democratic Republic of Loud Legacy Chapel. Let's vote the pastor out. No, you can't do that. God chooses pastor. If God doesn't like the pastor, he will be the one to remove him. Not you. The best you could do is to pray that the will of God is done. Hallelujah. So the king is the one that chooses what? His followers. Glory to God. Just like we see Jesus speaking clearly. He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. In fact, he said one time that if my father didn't even allow you to be part of my ministry, you couldn't be part of it. You couldn't. Even if you chose to be part of it, you just couldn't. It wouldn't work out. You will fizzle out. If my father didn't allow you to be part of it. In the book of Matthew 25, let's look at verse number 34. Look at what it says about the kingdom. Matthew 25 and verse number 34. We're still talking about kingdom citizens. The king will say to those on his right, You who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the foundations of the earth. Now, do you realize that Jesus is not talking about a new kingdom? He said, this kingdom I'm talking about all this while was created right from the foundations of the earth. Hello? It means God's original intention was for us to be in the kingdom. And like I said at the beginning of this teaching, I'm, I'm like, I've studied theology i've studied the bible i've been to bible schools at all kinds of levels and you barely see a course on the kingdom of god and, and let me just take a moment to even talk about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of god because there are two things you hear jesus use almost every now and then and almost every example jesus gives he gives it in relation to the kingdom he will say the kingdom of god is like the kingdom of heaven is likened unto and then think about it after 40 days of fasting and prayer he comes out and his maiden statement his opening statement before he even begins ministry he says it clearly he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is right here, right now, with you. 
He says the reason why I came is because Adam lost that kingdom when he rebelled against God, which was God's original plan for Adam to have dominion in the kingdom of God. But we know that Adam lost the kingdom when he rebelled against God and he allowed that which God had given him to be taken away from him. But he says, I am come again. And the reason why I'm come is to reestablish God's original intention, the kingdom. 